The presenting sponsor of On Education is Schoology. Listen, you're going to hear a lot about Schoology from us. Not just because they're our sponsor, but because we both use Schoology, and we don't think we'd ever go back to another learning management system. Schoology does grading, it does feedback, it has apps and tools to help you communicate with your students and their parents. Even better though, it lets students communicate with each other. To learn more about Schoology and how they can help you advance what's possible, visit Schoology.com. You know, any kid that looks at an app and it's called Schoolwork That's is going to go, good. ugh, Schoolwork. <laughs> that sounds like fun. Welcome to On Education. I'm Mike Washburn. And I'm Glenn Irvin. On today's show, we're going to take a deep dive on the big education-focused press event Apple held on Tuesday, March 27th. We'll talk about the major announcements, some news that probably won't get as much time in a newscast, but matters to teachers. And we'll wrap up this pod with some reaction to the event. But before we do any of that, we've got to talk about Ready Player One. We've got to talk about Ready Player One. Absolutely. So, yeah. I was geeking out the entire time. I was geeking out before. I geeked out constantly reading things in advance. I geeked out when I was sitting in the chair ready to go. I went and bought like the D. Have you ever, have you ever, I don't know if they have these in where you are, wherever you are, Minnesota, (laughs) the D box seats. Have you ever had these, what they call D box? They're, they're, they move, the they? chairs move while you're in the theater. Have you ever sat in one of these things? Um, I, I, I go to the ones where you could lean back and lounge. Is that no, no, what you're no, talking no. about? <laughs> so, no, 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 no. This is called the D, in Canada, they, they, in the Cineplex. Cineplex is a big chain of, of movie theaters. I don't, I don't okay. know what you guys have down there. But they have these seats, they're called D-Box. And you sit in them, yeah. and they move while the movie goes, and they, like, move with the movie. No way. So, you, so you're wearing the 3D glasses and you're moving. So anything that's like actiony, when this is this is like an action packed movie, sure. It the, the the seats are moving. Oh, it was awesome. It was so cool. We we went and bought the my buddy Dave, who I went with. I took my son Isaac. He's nine, and Dave said we got to get. I think we got to get D box for this. And I was like, okay, man, they're like fifteen dollars more. And he's like, we got to make it happen. Yeah. So we went and got we got the D box seats. Anyways, you you've read the book, right? I've, I've read the book, love the book. I read the audio. Well, I didn't read. I listened to the audio book. Still and fantastic, Will, right? For the record, yeah. For the record, Will Wheaton does the audio book. Oh my goodness, the guy and from it is Trek? it is yes, it is so good. He is he's a phenomenal audiobook reader, um, narrator. He's done a lot of other audiobooks. He does the second. Um, uh, Ernest Klein, the guy who wrote um, yeah. Ready Player One, yes. he did. He did his other book um, as well, the newer one that's only like a year old or so. Sure. Um, but but he's so good at this book, um, and I've been searching for like Will Wheaton's reaction to the movie. Haven't gotten it yet. I haven't. I haven't looked hard enough. I guess I didn't. I, I only care very little. But I mean, it's, I'm interested. It's, in... it's because he's going to destroy it. No, I'm just oh, <laughs> <laughs> that would be something. But anyways, I I thought it was fabulous. There are some things that I wish... Anyways, what I want to know is... I want to know your thoughts. What did you think about Ready Player One, Glenn? Um, Well, number one, I went into it with super low expectations because I saw a preview uh, that came out... It was probably like Christmas. The preview probably came out on Christmas time or maybe even before that. I can't remember. Uh, But I saw the preview and it was that race car scene, um, which I don't want to give any spoilers to anybody but anyway there's this race car scene and if you read the book which i read it and i read it really uh slowly which is uh, my way of saying i actually really cared about the book um i wanted to 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 really let it sink in because i i was really passionate about it anyway this race car scene comes up in this preview and i'm like where did that happen in the book because it didn't and so i was already kind of had low expectations coming in. Right. The movie was okay for me. You're I just mean, okay. You're and, okay. <laughs> and I and I was I was I was trying to be open minded about it, but there were several things about it that just I couldn't get past. All but, the, um... but for, for for everybody that really enjoyed it or goes and <laughs> enjoys it, 
that's fantastic. It's just that I had these certain things in my mind. And of course, it's hard for anybody to replicate, especially this science. Uh, if, well, I mean, probably any any book, but especially this kind of science fiction world um, where you have so many different things going on. You've got to have some sort of vision, you know, so Spielberg had this certain vision and that vision didn't really <laughs> correspond to the vision I had in my mind, which is going to happen. I, I guess that's that's going to happen when when you go to the thing. But you enjoyed it, right? I I loved it. I I think that I think it's a love letter to pop culture and to gamers for sure. I I think they missed some opportunities. Um, if you, if you haven't, I mean, I'm gonna spoiler alert. Whatever, <laughs> don't care. Deal with it. <laughs> I'm talking about it because I want to talk about it. And this is my podcast. Here we go. (laughs) They really missed an opportunity with the room. So Wade Watts goes to like a, he rents his own apartment at one point and he like walls it in. Yes. And because he's loaded at this point, he's rich, 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 rich. But he's really depressed too. And see, that was the part that, I mean, I'll let you keep finishing there, but here's the part that I think they totally missed. You just did Kanye. This is a dystopian, (laughs) this is a dystopian universe, right? Or a world in this book. And the book is dark, in my opinion. It it has this feeling like the world, we have basically trashed our world. And the only way to be able to escape is this, is this uh, alternate universe to be able to log in to this alt universe but the world is really horrible and yeah. it's not a pretty place. And even though they did a good job, like at the stacks and some different places, some different locales, it felt kind of, um, it felt light. The movie felt light to me. So it never see- felt like I was trapped in this world. Like, oh man, you know, kind of that feeling that you get in your gut when you, you're in, in dark, in, in a movie that's very dark. Mm-hmm. This is, felt very, very light, funny uh-huh. even. And I was like, oh, I wonder what that's kind of not what the book was. I don't they seem they seemed really happy for living in trailers on top <laughs> yes. of each other. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> right? That's I what mean, I'm saying. I mean, they're like, okay, well, you know, this is pretty awesome. We've got the extra deluxe trailer that's in the middle. Yes. Um and, yes. and and they're they're really happy to just, you know, wear their headsets and do their thing. Everyone was ordering pizza. I mean, there was I pizza boxes that. and yes. like product placement like crazy. Um I, I checked out. But they missed some opportunities. I think okay. they missed I think they missed the building of the room. Because the building of the room was really well described in the book. Yes. Where he like bars himself in with steel walls and steel doors that no one can get into because he's afraid he's gonna get attacked. And I think that that would have, I, I, I always used to be able to see that scene in my head. Yeah. Um, but they, they didn't do that. And they also got all of the players, the characters together really early. In the end, in the book, sorry, they're not really together until near the, pre, pretty much near the end. Um, and, and they got them together really early, which, which was also an interesting choice. Anyways, I, I thought it was fabulous. I, I smiled most of the way through. Um, my son, um, who is also kind of a, a loves video games and, and obviously because of me, I feel like lives in that world. Um, you know, he was like, Dad, Tracer, Tracer's in the movie. And, <laughs> and, and I'm like, yeah, buddy. And then he's like Ninja Turtles and he's like Battletoads. And, and he, he got all of the, a lot of Halo, Master Chief. And he's freaking out, right? And, and like, I, I like had this giant grin when there's a guy wearing the Starcraft like suit. Oh yeah. Um the 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 marine suit. Um I mean it, all of that stuff was so much fun. It's 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 Listen, please don't take it too seriously. <laughs> it's a it's a it's a video game centered action movie and I think that if you think of it exactly like that, I think it delivered a million percent. And I'll tell um, you, I will take my son to it. <laughs> Even, 100%. I went, I went you with should. my wife with it uh, to it, and I think he will, though obviously he hasn't read the book. And the book is more, I think it's more PG-13. I mean, well, it's opinion. definitely... Do you know what I mean? I, yeah, it, well, one of the things... Yeah, go ahead. One of the things they, they didn't do in the movie, and you're going to think that they did a lot of it, but in the book, the love story is way more like like 
Wade Watts's inner dialogue in the book about how much he loves the 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 the, the female character is obnoxious, I find. And in the movie, there's less of that. There's less of the love story and more of the goal in mind. I, I found the book to be completely obnoxious in terms of especially Wade Watts's inner dialogue. Maybe it was the way Will Wheaton was reading that inner dialogue to me. Okay. <laughs> but but either way, that that love story inner dialogue was 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 really the only thing I found super over the top in the book. And I'm glad that they dialed it down just a little bit in the movie. Um, so if you think that the movie had a lot of like cushy love story stuff in it, trust me, the book has, you know, probably double that yeah, in my opinion. I, I think, like I told you, the movie, I have a 10 year old, I'm going to take him to it because the movie's yeah. so light. It's very light. It's, it's yeah. not really, I didn't see, you know, there's a couple of things that are semi inappropriate, but there's nothing in it that I would be, you know, not wanting my kid to see. It's, it's fun. It's funny. Uh, but the book is dark, I think, and it, it it depicts a different world than what was displayed there. But again, it's a different vision, and they probably will do great as far as in the box office because of that. 100%. So we've got to stop talking about Ready Player One, and we've got to actually get into this Apple event. And when we come back, we're going to talk about the major announcements and what we heard from Apple. All right, welcome back. We are going to talk about the major announcements. I've got three on my list. I got three major announcements. These are the things that, I mean, I use iPads every day. Um, uh, I think Glenn does too. Glenn works, you work at an Apple school, if I'm not mistaken, right? Yes, we are an Apple K through 12 school. Right. So we're both using iPads every day. Um, so, So this is important to us, not just um, uh, from a podcast perspective. This is important to us as far as our day jobs are concerned. So uh, the new iPad is the obvious place to start. So let me break down basically what we've got here. We've got a 9.7 inch iPad, 8 megapixel rear camera, Touch ID, A10 processor. The biggest news, obviously, um, is the Apple Pencil support. This iPad now allows you to use that wicked stylus they got and um, and draw on the iPad, just like the iPad Pro. Uh, Glenn, what do you think? Um, The biggest thing, I I guess, I mean, the price is good, but it's not fantastic. I wish they would have came out with a price point uh, U.S. dollars less than two hundred and fifty dollars, if not. $199 $199 and the reason Imagine that. And reason why I'm saying that is if they really want to make a real impact um as far as in the industry education industry they have to compete with Chromebooks uh as far as the price point and that would make a humongous difference. The other thing is the best part you just talked about is that Apple Pencil which I've used the Apple Pencil not I don't have one but I've used it several different times at different exhibitions and different things with the iPad Pro. That thing is amazing and it does make a big difference. It's not just a stylus. It is definitely not just using your finger to be able to write anything. It is uh, phenomenal. And if it writes on this new iPad like it does on the iPad Pro and that's what everybody's saying it does, then that is is a game changer. But... Again, that Apple Pencil is $99. <laughs> I mean, it's $99. It's and, incredibly expensive. And that is something. I mean, can you imagine how easy it is to lose that thing? It's super I'm, easy to lose it. I mean, I'm sorry, but... Uh, I work in an elementary school. I guarantee you we would lose one a day if we gave every student an Apple Pencil. I know. I, I mean, we lose styluses all the time, and... I mean, this is a hundred dollar stylus. Now, I have a hard time not waxing poetic about how good this stylus is. Yeah. It's really good, and as soon as you try it, you will agree that it is really good. In fact, you will wonder why you've been using other styluses if you, or why you have never used a stylus. It's that good. I'm not joking. You got to use this. This is like one of those things. 
that you just wouldn't believe until you did it. But this stylus is unbelievable. It's also a hundred dollars. Yes. So, um, I mean, we're going to talk about some other, uh, okay. So, well, let's dig into it right now. So Logitech announced a $50 stylus. It's the first third party stylus to be announced, um, for iPad, uh, support that has the same kind of, um, functionality as an Apple pencil. What do you think? Uh, so yeah, fifty dollars stylus. Too little, too late. Um, no, I, I, I mean, I think it's great, especially if it does truly have that same functionality. Because if you've used that the Apple Pencil before, you understand that it has amazing pressure sensitivity. So when you're writing in cursive or you're drawing, even if you are a professional artist, the pressure you put on the pen is detected by the device. Now. Will these third-party pencils deliver the same, you know, uh, you know, amazingness of this iPad pencil? I, I don't know if it will. And so, and still, fifty dollars for a pencil <laughs> is just a lot of money. That's what I don't think they're getting. Uh, a lot of districts it automatically outprices them, and they're like, well, whether or not we were considering this, we're not going to pay this much for a stylus. Considering you get styluses for free at like education conferences and yes. stuff, I mean, a fifty dollars stylus is still insanely expensive. It is easily forty dollars more than I'm willing to pay for a stylus. <laughs> ten, and I ten dollars <laughs> is the price, <laughs> right? Well, maybe. I mean, I sorry, I should clarify. I have an Apple pencil. I use it. Uh, I I mean, so and but I didn't pay for it. And um, if I had to buy one, I wouldn't. Or yeah. if I didn't have one for free, I wouldn't buy it. Uh, $100 is too much. $50 is really pushing it. Like, I could see myself um, buying one for myself for Christmas or maybe my birthday. Or, or certainly buying one as a special, like a Christmas present. Or But my, my son is a really good artist. He, he does a lot of drawing. And we're trying to push him into... Um, digital art so that he can you know instead of all these papers lying around he can he can draw on an ipad and save it to somewhere and have it um, without you know worrying about it getting lost or ripped or damaged or whatever and i could see myself buying isaac a 50 dollars stylus i really honestly could because i could probably see myself buying him an apple pencil but it would be special and we would really lay down some rules now i have a um one-to-one program with um, 600 kids and I just don't see us not losing styluses constantly if we were to start um, really pushing these Apple pencils out or, or even these Logitech styluses parents go nuts go buy your kid a stylus if you want <laughs> absolutely uh, that's I'm cool with it I really am um, but it's your responsibility not ours uh, and and I just can't I couldn't handle the pressure of keeping everyone's styluses safe and uh, from getting lost. It would be insane. Lost so, or stolen? I mean, hundred dollars is is a valuable item, and man, it's too easy to take a pencil. I mean, it, I'm just sorry. It's just it it and whatever kind of technology it has inside of it, Apple yeah. needs to realize that if they just have these as part of the iPads or give yeah. them or sell them for $10, as you said, then it b- includes all schools, all school districts. Then we can all be like, okay, we can definitely use this, you know, hundred mm-hmm. percent. So, um, price, not really any cheaper than it was in the, actually not at all cheaper. In fact, um, uh, a little bit cheaper stylus, a little bit better specs. It's a nice iPad. Um, so some other changes, new iWork apps uh, for um, for the iPad. So Pages, Keynote, Numbers, all have Apple Pencil support, which is pretty sweet. It means you can draw on spreadsheets, on pages. You could create notes. You could do journaling and notebooks and reflections with handwritten notes, I guess. Um, but I guess the question I have about this stuff, and I mean, again, this is all super pretty cool stuff. I I do this stuff in my class um for me um but i mean we've had some of these tools before uh notability yes. seesaw um lots of other um evernote um uh there used to be a they used to promote this other one day one or one day or 
Yes. Can't remember the name of it. Yes. But it was like a journaling, another journaling app. Student documentation reflection, big deal. Um, lots of growth in that. Lots of great ideas. It's something I totally believe in. Um, but I don't know. Does this does this do anything for that? Because I mean, still a lot of kids aren't doing this. Um, certainly not doing it on their iPads. There's certainly a lot of written, handwritten notebooks floating around my school. Um, does this move us towards a paperless classroom um, anytime soon, do you think? I don't think so. And the reason why is what we just talked about. The price, price. point actually sets yeah. you, basically says, you know what? Only certain people are going to be able to afford this. So everybody else, which is the majority of us and the majority of our school districts, which are cash strapped, just won't uh, put out money to be able to do this. You know, the Apple Pencil, um, could it eventually, you know, something like that, being able to annotate directly and be able to write, could it then result in the paperless classroom? Possibly, you know. But there's still a lot, uh, I think, a lot of work there. And that price point is really not going to make a big difference. Uh, I just I don't see a bunch of people going out there and going, yeah, let's go ahead and invest in these. I teach a, I teach a lot, um, uh, I mean, with these iPads. But I, I don't use them as much with... Um, with that, with that, as styluses and and stuff like that, and and journaling is done on different things. I just use different tools. Now that being said, here's the one other thing, and I I, I actually talk to the kids a lot about this, um, is that Apple tends to lead, and a lot of other people follow in in a lot of cases. Um, there's some cases where Apple Apple follows watches and uh, wearables and stuff like that. Apple tended to wait until to see what everyone does, but. Um, I think about things like flat design. So I, I, I do a lot of graphic design teaching and I talk about flat design and how flat design was a thing, but it wasn't super popular until iOS 7 came out. When iOS 7 came out and all those app icons changed to this flat design, now you see flat design everywhere and everyone's, it, it's a trend it, and they changed it. And I mean, Apple changed things like um, getting out of Flash uh, and into HTML5. And like there's some sectors where Apple just said, no, we're not doing it anymore. Um, and USB-C is, I guess, the newest one. Right. And yes. and so I'm wondering, does this now that there's a pathway for Apple to do this in their own ecosystem, does this force everyone else to go in that same direction where now we're all going to now that we have pathways towards journaling and documentation and stuff? which again are growing trends, great, awesome things happening in this. But now that there's a pathway towards it with Apple products, does everyone start to move in that same direction? So specifically regarding being able to annotate directly with the Apple pencil, like a pencil well, type of item? Is that also, just in regards to the trend of, of journaling and student documentation. I mean, again, this stuff isn't happening a whole lot right now. It's happening a little. But now that Apple has really set a path that they can you can use their ecosystem to do all this you have the two sorry we don't even talk about it the 200 gig increase in iCloud now you can you know kids can hand write notes in pages using a stylus and save them right into their into their iCloud and and does this you know now does does Chrome and 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 Google come back with something um, similar or at least put try to put more um market, you know, sway into moving everyone into that direction. Does this move everyone's ship in the same direction now uh, with this stuff? I think it's super important. I mean, just like you said, journaling, reflection, being able to to annotate, to document your own work, being able to okay. basically uh, manipulate any type of learning materials and make them your own is the trend, Is is what everybody wants. So the first question anybody asks... For example, we uh, obtained some Nearpod licenses. So mm. a teacher is is delivering instructional materials. And the first thing that the teacher actually wants to know on the student side, can they take notes? Can they basically uh, take notes on top of their materials, their slides that they're presenting so right. that it makes them significant for 
uh, for that specific individual? And then the answer is yes. And then the answer is not only do, can they do that, but it automatically puts them into their Google Drive, for example. But the I, I think the, the, the one piece that's still missing for all of this type of stuff is, are we going to move towards a keyboard-centric type of world, or are we still talking about writing, you know, you know what I mean? Still cursive and circling and being able to use those things with a touch screen, you know? Mm-hmm. So those two things are, uh, I think, always in constant battle with each other. And they're kind of trying to find the combination of the two things, which I, I, I mean, the iPad is that magical tool that, that merges those two worlds. I just wish it was cheaper. Yeah. Don't, uh, first off, don't get me started on cursive. I will go crazy <laughs> about cursive. We're going to talk about cursive later. Okay. I'm saving it. Okay. I have a, a rant in the pocket about cursive. Anyways, right. listen, we can't do any of this stuff without uh, a bunch of uh, new tool about without tools and manage this stuff and apps and stuff like that. So um, Apple has announced uh, a brand new uh, app uh, called Schoolwork. Um, to coincide with the other two school-focused apps that they have, Apple Classroom and Apple School Manager. Um, I found that when I was watching some reaction on Twitter that a lot of people didn't exactly know what these things do. So, I mean, this is the informative section of the podcast yes. where I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually break down exactly what these things do um, so that uh, so that you guys know the difference, because there is a huge difference um, in particular um, as it relates to how teachers deal with them uh, and in 100 percent how students deal with them. So Apple Classroom, Apple Classroom um, is a teaching assistant app. Um, you can use Apple Classroom to track your students. To It's a classroom management tool. You can see their screens. Um, you can push all of the students into a specific app. Um, you can lock all of the student screens. Um, you can bring something up on your iPad and then throw it to them, so to speak. Um, you can launch apps for them that then get um, put onto their iPads. You can even, um, what I love is my kids, for some reason, especially my younger ones, always forget the um, pass their passcodes. So I have, you know, I have a spreadsheet that has all of the passcodes for my kids, and uh, I can use Apple Classroom to reset their passcodes um, right from Apple Classroom. Uh, It is a really cool app for um, classroom management. Um, and uh, I love Apple Classroom quite a bit. Apple School Manager is an IT um, portal uh, to manage people and devices and content. So this is where you um, you initiate um, profiles and you you push profiles with certain apps loaded on them so that they get them pushed to all the iPads. Um, you can um, see the status of a device. Um, uh, it, I think you can see, in fact, where a device is on, for example, which IP it's connected on. It's it's really a IT management system. It is used in the back end. So students have very little contact with Apple School Manager. And frankly, the rank and file teacher would not usually have... Um, interactions with Apple School Manager. Now, the new one is Schoolwork. So Schoolwork um, allows teachers to communicate with their students, hand out assignments uh, such as homework, activities, uh, mark, uh, mark or grade. I use the word mark. We've talked about this before. <laughs> Actually, I don't think we've talked about this. But anyways, you're going to hear me say mark. Then Glenn's going to say grade. And that's a Canadian American thing. Deal with it. Marking assignments, grading assignments, uh, you can um, push um, files and notes to um, to Apple uh, Apple iPads, um, and this is where that 200 gig of Apple iCloud storage comes in really handy. Because in a Apple centric world, you would see people using Schoolwork to receive notes, PDFs, 
hand in assignments, um, receive documents and stuff like that. This is basically Google Classroom. Now, here's my thought on this is that it is I think it's too little too late. I think Google Classroom is great. Um, I think that um, and, and really here's OK. So let me ask you, what do you think about schoolwork? This is the new one. What do you think about schoolwork? Well, the first thing I was thinking about is I want to be on Apple's development team, educational development team, yeah. because I want to be able to get paid lots of money for coming up with an innovative name like schoolwork as my <laughs> classroom management system. Uh, it's like, really? You are a billion dollar corporation that is, I think, it really connected to education. It has, has been for a long time. But they yet, workshop that and everything. But yet, this is the <laughs> best idea you can come up with. Here's our learning management system. It's going to be called schoolwork. And so <laughs> at first when I saw that, I was like, Ugh. oh, that's bad. Um, but then I, I looked at it as you did as far as what it actually does. And it is a copy of Google Classroom. Um, are, is it free? Mike, I'm not sure. Is is it free of you? I I would be stunned if if this is a paid app. I would lose my mind. <laughs> Speaking of rants, so so it better be free. That's the next part, uh, and it really is just emulating um, what we have. Uh, if you if you were a Google Classroom school, and if you've never used Google Classroom, basically it allows you to. Um, as a teacher to create assignments and as a te- as a student to turn in assignments it is the uh, at the most basic level a learning management system but it's not that robust i guess that's the best way to be able to put it so it's a very simple turn in uh, give out and turn in device type system so that's what it looks like to me um will it work uh, seamlessly with iPads, I would hope so. You know, so you that may be their advantage is if it's super easy to be able to work within that ecosystem, then you might have people going, hey, we just want to use the schoolwork system. It's it's a lot easier than like, yeah, go ahead. Like if you can, if you listen, if you can, if you can do something like and explain everything, if you can draw something or write something or create something, and explain everything, hit share, hit schoolwork and bam, it's, and it pulls up if it can like, uh, if it uses some sort of, uh, um, uh, system that pulls in various assignments or whatever that you've made in schoolwork so that you can submit it to a specific assignment. Listen, that, that might be okay. It, it, it might work, but I, I have another bone to, to pick with this thing. I, I didn't even think of the name, which, you know, now that I'm thinking about it, you know, any kid that looks at an app and it's called schoolwork That's is going to go, good. ugh, <laughs> schoolwork. That sounds like fun. Um, but even more fun is when you call an app called schoolwork something that works like email because there's nothing that kids love more than email. Am I right? No. I mean, this is ridiculous. Saying something is like email is really the worst part. Like, I, I wrote notes aggressively about this when they when they said that this is like email. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Like email? Like, I mean, that's it's it, it, it's demonstrating a message of simplicity, I suppose. And they've never been around kids. Because if they ever don't if, if they care, ever, yeah, if they ever hear any kid, if you've ever heard any kid talking about email, uh, it's only in regards to things that they have to do at uh-huh. usually the middle school or high school level. That is formal a, things, is adult work, you know, resumes. Yes, it's not anything <laughs> that they're familiar with that they use. For example, Snapchat or any other kind of uh, social 100%. media. It, those are the things, or messaging, you know, those kinds of things that they're used to. Um, this is when you, again, Mike, we could be hired for their, their department (laughs) there and, and, and sell them on the idea of totally that that their message and their, uh, their messaging, like you said, should be centered around, oh, this is as easy as sending an email. It's like, that's horrible. Don't, 
Yeah. It, it does not convince me. If I was a student, I'd be like, you know, if you had said this is like sending a Snapchat yes. message, I they would be like, what? That's the best. Like, I remember a few years ago, I, we use Schoology and, and I and I love Schoology. And when I when we when we brought on Schoology about three years ago, the first thing we said to them, you know how we presented it to kids? You know what we said? Uh, and you, you've heard this before. I know you've heard this before. We said, it looks like Facebook. And the kids went, Facebook? That's amazing. We have a thing that we can hand in homework, and it looks like Facebook? That's awesome. And yeah, that's that was kind of the whole point. If you want people on board, if you want kids on board with this, saying, saying this is like email is absolutely the worst possible thing to say. (laughs) I can't stress that enough. It's insane. So, schoolwork. It is a LMS light. It is like Google Classroom. Um, We do see a lot of schools and districts using LMS lights uh, instead of installing like huge systems like Blackbot or or Schoology um, to do all of their LMS stuff. Do you think you could, first off, you're at Apple school. You're obviously going to look at this. Yes. Do you think you could see yourself using this on the regular? No. <laughs> and there's a couple of reasons why. Uh, the Cut. reason why you, That's it. <laughs> that you call it LMS light. Right. Um, is because it's not robust enough. So, no. So here's the thing that an, a real LMS would do is it would give the ability for your entire, for all of your, um, for all of your parents, um, your uh, administration, counselors, uh, teachers, and students to be able to all work within the same system and be able to obtain the information they need to be able to make certain decisions or to be able to do work or to be able to gather the information they need for an assignment. And an LMS light solution is basically a teacher-student uh, passback system. It's, and that's all it is, is I create assignment A, I push it out to you, you do assignment A, and you push it back to me. And there is no nothing beyond that, that parameter there. So why even delve into it for us? You know, we are also a school G district, of course. Why even go there and add another layer? Do you know what I mean? As far as another layer of something else when we could just, you know, use Schoology. Totally. All right. Well, those are the big announcements. There are lots of other small announcements, small things that they talk to us. So when we come back, we're going to break down some of those that may have fallen under the radar. All right, welcome back. So next up, I want to talk about some of these smaller things. These smaller things are things that I care about. Glenn probably cares about some of them. These are things that you're not going to see on The Verge or uh, or on TV. Uh, uh, you know, these Apple conferences, these Apple, sorry, these Apple events um, do get on the news. But they're not going to talk about these things. That's for sure. Okay, so... AR. I'm listen, I I love AR. I think it's really cool. I've used AR in a grade 5 assignment. Um it was incredibly engaging and incredibly uh difficult to to do it. It it was a ton of work. Um it was an amazing demonstration of our kids um work. Um we used it for what we call student led conferences. These are like parent teacher interviews, but the students do them themselves. Um and uh, you know, as a private school, which is what I work at, it was uh, definitely an impressive demonstration of the school's ability to use technology. Um parents were impressed. So, um Apple is really pushing AR. They're they're pushing it hard. Uh, I think that there's some neat things um, in it, uh, I want to get your thoughts, Glenn. Have you used AR in your class? Um, if you did, would you do? Um, and if you haven't, I'm curious why you haven't. My favorite augmented reality is what we're talking about, right? 
Uh, yeah. App is Erasma, and yes. that's probably the most common one that people have ever heard of or used in some format or, or the other. And yep. there are a lot of ways to be able to go ahead and, just like you said, um, really leverage the technology, uh, especially if you have iPads uh, or any kind of mobile devices. You can really do some amazing things. Basically, embed, um, for us, it was in a language classroom, you could embed uh, speaking uh, activities and listening activities within a picture uh, that you maybe put around the classroom or some other t- sort of objects that you um, that you have preset inside of the Erasma app. The difficult component of it on the teaching side is what you just said. It, it's time. There, you have to have a well thought out plan, and then being able to go in and execute that plan usually takes a lot of time, much more time than you would normally use for a different activity. So I could see what you're talking about there. Uh, I like your idea about the student led conferences. Uh, being able to integrate that because it's something visually that's stunning. Uh, and it, when people aren't used to it and they see uh, through the vision as far as the iPad and be mm-hmm. able to see this augmented reality, it really does make a difference because it it's so different. But I don't know, you know, I don't know if it's worth the amount of time and in investment for, you know, me and you are mega geek kind of nerds, you know, and we're willing to take risks and time on things that are out there as far as tech is concerned. I, I don't know if you're super geek. I, yeah. I don't know Thank if your you. everyday teacher is gonna, you know, first of all, they have to learn how to use it. And then to be able to put together a lesson that's effective, it, it takes time. And it's, it, it, you know, I, that's one thing that teachers always say, they don't really have that much time. Uh, so, yeah, go ahead. So I rolled this out. Um, I, I So my MO, what I tend to do is I tend to write assignments uh, for um, for a grade, for a class, for a, a whatever, with the with the teacher's blessing. But I tend to push, write, a, write an assignment. I come up with an idea and I say, I talk to them. I get an idea of how they've delivered it in the past. And, I, and then I go back and I kind of workshop it. And I and I write up a workflow, and then I and then I deliver it almost like a deliverable, like I'm a, like I'm the I'm the um, salesperson, and my teacher that I'm working with is the client, and um, and so I put together this AR assignment um, focused on uh, it's a ge- it was a geography assignment, and um, the first time I do this in almost every class place lesson whatever when i'm building one of these cool ed tech integrated assignments is uh, i do almost all of the work so it's like i'm teaching my own class uh because i'm a computer science teacher but i'm also teaching um grade five geography as well and and then um but you're right about the one thing that the the three teachers that taught the three grade five classes didn't have a clue or or at least didn't um, were an experience, and so I had to kind of walk them through it a bit. Uh, and I I, lo- I love that experience as a technology integrationist. But you know, I love the the three grade five teachers I was working with are are three of my favorite people in the world. Um, hi guys, you're probably listening. Um, <laughs> and and um, but but I definitely and they would acknowledge I definitely had to walk them through how to do it the first time. My goal is to walk them through it in a way that the second year they do it, they can do it themselves with just a little less help from me. And then and so on, we we go forward where they're doing it less and less um, with my intervention and my work um, uh, in it so that it then becomes something that they own. And once they have the knowledge of it, they can then modify it or whatever. Um, but like you said, I'm, I'm kind of going off a little bit, but what you said was that the teachers don't have a lot of experience in this. And that is the one thing that's really hard uh, to do um, is, is that the, the teachers just don't have a lot of knowledge in this. Um, I would love to see AR become something that is a creation tool um, more than a consumption tool, but definitely I can tell you that I feel like AR right now, unless you're working incredibly hard, it is a consumption tool for sure. 
Um, it, there needs to be a major push on PD uh, for this in order to get teachers up to speed for it to be a creative tool. The, uh, yeah. <laughs> there was no, You had no thoughts on that. We're going to cut that part out. <laughs> I thought you were in, I, Glenn. I thought you were ending that. <laughs> that <segment>. Well, no. <laughs> let's let's talk about Swift Playgrounds. Um, again, this is another app I use. Um, I am a computer science teacher, um, and I use Swift Playgrounds to teach coding. I used it this year with grade fours and fives, um, and they they kind of packaged Swift Playgrounds in this um, presentation in with Apple Teacher, uh, which I thought was a little bit weird, but whatever there is a second tier apple teacher for for people who want to get um uh, a swift playground sort of certification uh it's not a whole lot harder than getting apple teacher level one for lack of i don't know what you call it but the first phase of apple teacher um it's it, it literally was maybe um an hour's more work for me to get um the apple teacher with swift playgrounds um it's not hard um, I guess my concern about Apple Teacher is that there's not really a whole lot of community there. Um, there is Apple communities, that's for sure. Um, there's a lot of um, talk on Twitter and a lot of conferences dedicated to iPads. Um, but if Apple Teacher really wants to build this out, I think they need to put a more robust effort into community building um, so that Apple Teacher is more than just words on a resume. What do you think? I agree. I think that a lot of these companies miss the boats when it comes to professional development and really building uh, teachers up, uh, not only using their platform to learn how to use the specific tools, you know, whatever those tools may actually be, uh, but then learn how to use them in a way to make their teaching more dynamic. And that's really the next level. And that's when you know, I'm an instructional coach, and that's really what I talk about all the time. It's not just about the tool itself, but how does that now change the teaching, your teaching, and things that you were not uh, previously able to do? Can you now do those things? And if you can't, then maybe we shouldn't be using this tech. You know, it's not worth the time or investment or whatever it might be. Um, so as you just said, it's more than just getting a little Apple certification uh, icon next to your Twitter name or whatever it might be. It should be something where you have, uh, you know how to make a specific impact to student learning um, through the use of tech. And it, it should be significant where you are like, yes, I did learn a lot. It, it really brought, uh, opened my mind to a lot of different ideas. And now I can even, like you just said, uh, I can actually go ahead and be part of a community um, sort of like, I mean, we always go back to this sort of like our Schoology community where we're always bouncing ideas off of each other, sharing items with each other, and really yeah. pushing our teaching uh, and student learning to new levels because we're part of this community. 100%. Um, Swift Playgrounds, so the, they, they did lump Swift Playgrounds in with Apple Teacher in this presentation. Now, I use, like I said, it with my fours and fives. Um, but one of the things that I've always had a problem with, and now this these presentations aren't talking to me and they're probably not actually even really talking to you. You're an Apple school. Um, I am, uh, you know, we are one-to-one -one through the board, uh, through wall-to-wall -wall Apple. Um, and most, but most public schools, uh, even in Ontario, which has, you know, a pretty um, technological, uh, technology focused education system, um, does not have a computer class. So there's no computer studies course. There's no computer studies grade in the report card. And there's no scheduled computer studies time. Most of computer studies time in a public school is done in the library. So I guess what I'm worried about is, you know, I don't mind that. I, I love the push for programming. I love the idea of teaching um, kids coding. I'm just wondering where we're going to fit all this in. Where are we going to fit? teaching coding into uh, a teacher's insane teaching schedule? Um, I was thinking uh, cursive writing. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> uh. I was going to bring that one up. No, I, I, I agree with you. Um, and I think that's the reason why I'm agreeing with you is 
we have such I'm awesome. We, yeah, okay, well that too. <laughs> um, but we have such high demands on our time in school, and that's what yeah. I don't know if a lot of people understand that uh, unless you've actually been within a school district. Um, and what I'm talking about is basically you have so much stuff that's that's you must do within a limited amount of time that all of those really interesting things that really hook your kids, a lot of the times those things get left out. Uh, and sometimes they're things that, you know, people have fought for to be able to bring back into the schools like music or uh, physical education, uh, those types of things, um, where even those things would be pushed by the wayside to make sure that our math and um, reading scores are to the level that they should be. And so c- when you bring another topic in, like coding, um, the only concerning part about it is that you would then repl- use coding to replace something else. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So in other words, mm-hmm. I've heard the talk, you know, I'm a second language teacher. So the talk of that coding is a second language. And I'm not going to make uh, that argument or argue against it or say that it is is right or wrong. The thing that's right or wrong is making these things compete against each other. You know, basically saying a student can't learn Spanish and coding because they have to choose one or the other, which is just ridiculous and kind of part of the reason why our system and, and part of the reason why this podcast even exists is we have such a broken system, which is ways of being able to we're compartmentalizing so many different things and are hyper focused on things that maybe we shouldn't be so hyper focused on instead mm-hmm. of letting kids basically experience things and get, be okay and passionate about a wide variety of topics and coding is not going away and we know that coding and learning different types of coding results in uh, you can pick up all kinds of different careers based upon that knowledge um and use it in a variety of different careers, even teaching, <laughs> as we have just uh, you know talked about before. So my biggest concern overall is is saying we're gonna where are we gonna find that time? But is it gonna replace something that already currently exists? And when we do stuff like that, I think it always is a negative thing. Well, and our teachers capable. I mean, we just had this conversation with AR. Uh, this is another thing. This is worse than AR. Frankly, um, we have uh, teachers that are just completely incapable of teaching this. Or I, I shouldn't say that. I I, I I I regret saying that. In fact, I'm not saying that they're incapable. I'm just saying they're not able to teach it right now. Uh, I wouldn't doubt that any teacher is capable of learning this. Um, whether teachers have the will, the desire, the the drive, the ambition. To learn how to integrate coding into the class, that's, a, I suppose, a different story. But there's certainly not a lot of, in, in Ontario, any, there's certainly not a lot of new teachers coming up that are, are for lack of better words, digital natives or whatever word you want to use now uh, to infer that you have a, a, a wide knowledge of technology and how it interacts with education. Uh, but we certainly have teachers that, um, as a whole, I mean, are they ready to teach com- are your teachers ready to teach computer programming in the classroom, Glenn? Um, absolutely not. And I think that uh, a lot of the times, and it's not because of anybody's specific fault. It's that, number one, they've never received the professional development to do it. And number two, it's so new. Uh, it's such a new thing. And a lot of people, are, I think, are waiting for this to actually disappear. <laughs> it's kind of like one of the many trends that happen in education where we are waiting for it to kind of pass us by so that we could ignore it for a little while and then eventually it just leaves and we're like, oh, cool, that's gone now. We don't have to worry about it. Uh, Coding's not going to leave. No. But one of the things that we can talk about as far as training people, you know, as far as professional development, as far as coding, uh, I've seen several different pushes regarding coding and I think they're okay, uh, but they're not uh, high-level coding uh, per se. So, you know, this this big uh, code.org movement where students are using that site to be able to get introduced to coding. Um, but the coding that they're talking about, as you know, Mike, is very 
uh, low level, elementary, basic, you know, a very, very thing. Yeah. You're talking about clicking together the concepts wow. of, yes, of coding. True coding is is complex and we need computer science teachers coming out of, like you just said, the universities um, that have the experience and knowledge of how to go ahead and go about teaching these things. And then we need the, obviously the time uh, and um, and resources to be able to go ahead and make that happen for our students also. And so I think we're way a, a, a very, very far away from that actually happening. By very, very far away, I mean, I don't see it happening within the next five years. But I, I, I'm not sure as far as in the United States. But what do you think as far as Canada? Well, I mean, I, I actually say this all the time to parents um, because I'm the computer science teacher. Um, I don't have a computer science degree. I, I used to always say if I was a programmer, I'd be programming. I'm a teacher. I teach. Um, so I don't have I all of the stuff that I know and have learned. I've taught myself. Um, oh, and, I totally and agree. I, I'm, I'm in the yeah. exact same boat. And there's very there's few there's quite a few of us that are in that same boat where we just we're learning as we go along and we're passionate about it. So we're willing to go ahead and take on mm-hmm. that learning and then be able to pass that on to our students. Yeah. Um, when we come back, we're going to wrap up this uh, this episode with some thoughts on the event, uh, how it may or may not move the needle in Apple's direction. All right, welcome back. Um, we're going to just give you some reaction now i think that there's been a lot we've talked about a lot this has been a full episode um glenn does this move the needle in apple's direction do you really think um as far as devices in schools as far as devices because that's all apple really this is that's the game here is devices they need ipads in the school iWorks, classroom schoolwork nothing matters if iPads aren't in the hands of kids, does this move the needle in their direction, um, in the direction of putting more devices in people's hands? Well, I unfortunately think that no, it doesn't. It doesn't really, it didn't have the impact that I was hoping it would have. Uh, when we were all um, going, uh, hearing the hype about this event, I was actually hoping that they would significantly reduce the price of the iPad uh, and any type of accessories. So, for example, the pencil or whatever it might be, so that all schools would at least be tempted to move in that direction. So Chromebooks are significantly cheaper. Um, They are the number one device that's being used as far as in schools. In order for for Apple to make an impact they have to significantly reduce that price by at least $100, I believe. And as we just talked about earlier in the episode, the Apple Pencil, the ability to be able to write with the Apple Pencil on the, this new iPad is fantastic. As a consumer of iPads, you know, in my own personal uh, home, I might buy the Apple Pencil and an iPad but that doesn't mean that we're going to buy thousands of iPads for our school districts and thousands of Apple pencils now for the, our students because they reduced it, you know, a significant amount, an insignificant amount. Uh, sorry. Um, and I think it's actually the same price as we usually get when uh, right around uh, Black Friday, if I'm if I'm not mistaken. That uh, two ninety nine price point is is a price point that has been hit by other iPads. Um, so no, it it didn't move the needle for me. Um, I I think a lot of people were very disappointed um, by the announcements because basically we were saying if you're going to make a big impact, you really have to reduce the price significantly. What do you think, Mike? You have to. You have to reduce the price. That is where this battle is being fought. Uh, You know, I think that this is a classic indication that Apple, while they um, get the top line, the goals and ambitions, this is classic Apple, right? They, they understand the goals and ambitions of education. They understand the, the nice, the fluffy cloud that is teaching kids 
um, and shepherding the future into the unknown and all of that wonderful, beautiful stuff. Um, but, you know, they don't sit in a classroom. They don't sit in a boardroom uh, when they're saying, listen, we can buy a thousand Chromebooks, um, which will give us Chromebooks for every kid, or we can buy, you know, 30 iPad carts, uh, 30 iPad carts um, that students, that classes will have to share. Um, what do we do? We want to put a device in everyone's hand. We buy Chromebooks. It's just the reality of the situation. It's it's absolutely just the way it is. In reality, this is a money game, and Apple still is going to keep losing if they can't get something. Regardless of quality, big fan of Apple. Obviously, lots of their stuff. I'm surrounded by Apple products right here, and I'm surrounded by Apple products at work. But that being said, I work at a private school. It is a lot easier to be surrounded by products that are thousands and thousands of dollars when you have thousands of dollars. Public schools do not have thousands of dollars. And trust me, we're going to be getting into that later. So before we uh, go, Mike, I was just going to throw out the scenario for you. Since we were already saying we were going to be uh, pretending to be Apple execs uh, and working on their ad teams and their ed team, uh, one of the things that I think their education team really needs to be aware of is if they get these devices in students' hands, they do make a difference as whether or not that student later on in their life will continue to use these this same ecosystem through college, through their professional career, et cetera, as they move on. So what you want to do, you know, if, if we were there working for them is really price point these things where they're like $99 and where a, a school can't, uh, they can't look away from it and go and say, well, we could get this other Chromebook because as a keyboard, they're like, no, you know what? That thing, that iPad does so much amazing things on the creative yeah. side um, that we have to go with that. And then now every school has iPads, not just some schools. Every student has been exposed to the power of the iPad, the power of the pencil, and the and the apps uh, that run within this ecosystem. And then later on in their lives, they will continue to purchase these products. But they seem like they're just so greedy <laughs> that they're like, hmm. we're going to bring it down an extra $20 or whatever it might be you know, at that two ninety nine price point. And that just doesn't work within the school budgets. Yeah. We don't have the money to be able to go ahead and purchase those at a mass level at every school. Yes. Nailed it. That's it. Um, so, yeah. I mean, final question is Apple, uh, was this Apple event a, a nothing burger or a, uh, a game changer, Glenn? Uh, a big nothing burger. How about yeah. for you? Well, <laughs> you know, I, I don't want to. I I don't want to equivocate because I did only give you two choices. So I will. Uh, I will also say uh, nothing burger. Unfortunately, on education is an on podcast media production. My name is Mike Washburn. My co-host is Glenn Irvin. You can get in touch with us or ask us questions to answer on air by visiting our website oneducationpodcast.com. You can tweet us at oneducationpod. Glenn is Irv Spanish on Twitter, and I can be found on Twitter at Mr. Washburn. You can find us on Facebook by visiting facebook.com slash oneducationpod. If you're enjoying the show and think others would too, we'd love for you to share it with them. Please leave us a rating or review in Apple Podcasts or Google Play Store. When you're leaving a rating, it gives our rankings a boost. This helps others discover the show. We'd really like to thank our presenting sponsor, Schoology, for supporting us. Check out Schoology.com to learn how they can help you advance what's possible. Thanks as always for listening. Stay awesome. See you soon. <laughs>